So, after the last issue managed to instill some confidence in me, I'm feeling pretty good about issue 6. And it starts off pretty strong with the cover, showing that this is going to be a tie-in with a specific Sonic game. Sonic Spinball. Also, this pun. Sonic Spinball's hard enough without having to wear this. I told you, this is a comic book tie-in! <laughs> This is actually a really nice looking cover. Not only does it advertise what's inside the comic fairly well, but the art is great, painting a really good scene that is true to the game it's trying to advertise. While back in issue 4 we got a general advertisement for Sonic platformers, and the whole series is basically made to advertise the games, this is the first time that a specific game has been adapted into comic book format. So let's see how it goes. We open on the start of our first story, The Spin Doctor, part... Uh, part... Wait, there's no part one? Oh my god, it's a complete story without pointlessly being cut in half! Joy of joys! The story begins with the Freedom Fighters charging triumphantly forward, Sonic leading them, intent on invading and destroying Robotnik's empire once and for all. Ah yes, the triumphant charge, a trope used in such uplifting fiction as 300 and Charge of the Lights Brigade. Not that it matters anyway, as their suicidal charge is brought to a close when they reach Robotnik's headquarters and discover that it has been shut down, for good according to the sign out front. Sonic reads the note left behind, which explains that Robotnik's moved his operations to the inside of an active volcano, and that there's no way Sonic can stop him. Ha 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 ha. Sally tries to warn Sonic that it's obviously a trap, but nope, Sonic's already off to do hero things because we need a plot. We cut to a rather imposing looking volcano, Robotnik's new hideout, with long rails leading inside. Sonic actually takes a moment to think about how best to proceed, wondering what the rails are for. He's rewarded for his patience by getting knocked into a pool of lava with a pinball paddle. However, rather than being a tragedy, the magma seems to follow Super Mario 64 rules, and so Sonic merely skips across the surface like a hot potato. <laughs> thank you, thank you, I'll be here all week. Sonic leaps onto the rails and uses it to dash inside, while Robotnik, watching one of those plot convenience monitors everyone seems so fond of, expounds the details of his plan. How once Sonic is out of the way, the Vegematic machine located inside his fortress will roboticize the world. And then he strikes a Power Ranger pose. Okay. Back with Sonic, he's traveling down the rails, taking in the sight of some deadly-looking toxic waste, never noticing the big dragon head that is practically lying across the rails in front of him. This is Rexon, one of the most terrifying things in Sonic Spinball. Seriously, that thing gave me nightmares as a kid playing this game. He's much less terrifying here, however, and he talks. Rather than just trying to eat Sonic, as he is wont to do in the games, he lifts Sonic upwards so that he can meet the boss of this zone, Scorpius. A scorpion robot with Robotnik's head. Petrifying. Luckily, he's all look and no danger as Sonic merely bounces between the two of them, easily taking them out before continuing on his way. He runs into two kangaroos named Hip and Hop, who warn him about a pack of pharaons ahead. And that is literally all they're there for. Sonic runs into the Pharons and immediately destroys them all. Tension? What's that? Robotnik is, understandably, getting fed up that all of his tricks and traps are failing, and Sonic taunting him all the time certainly doesn't help much either. But Sonic stops for a moment when he hears sobbing mixed in with several animal noises. He's flipped up to round three, the machine round, by a helpful nearby flipper, and lands in front of a huge holding tank full of helpless animals, soon to be turned into robot slaves. Sonic prepares to bust them out, but before he can muster up the energy for a Sonic spin, he's accosted by a large, hungry plant head. Soon, more start to chomp at our hero, forcing him towards a door marked to Robotnik. Well, if 80s cartoons have taught me anything, then that is probably a very poor choice. And I was right. The door slams shut behind Sonic, saving him from the plants, but locking him in level 4, Showdown. Robotnik now has the hedgehog right where he wants him. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So of course he... just launches him out of the lair with a conveniently placed spring trap. 
No attempts at roboticizing him, no badnik army, no lasers, not even an annoying spike trap at the other end of the spring. Just launching him to his freedom. You suck at this, Robotnik. Lucky for Sonic, however, Sally had Tails on hovering duty just in case Sonic needed some assistance, allowing Sonic to avoid a rather nasty fall. Sonic says that he thinks it's probably not the last time he'll be going through that volcano, and... Uh, that's it? Wait, wait, that was the end? Seriously? Well, that's a freaking downer. It's even worse in hindsight because we never revisit the spinball concept again. This is the only story that ever uses it. What happened to the critters? What about the Vegematic? Is it going to roboticize the world? Well, obviously not, but it's just a really big disappointment that the story just ends like this. They don't even encourage you to go out and buy the game, it just... It ends. They did ask kids to write in if they wanted to see more stories centered around Spinball, but that obviously didn't happen. It's a shame, too, because, well, ending aside, this is a really good adaptation of the spin-off. I'm serious, it's a fast-paced and frantic story that introduces the reader to all the elements of the game while managing to tell something resembling a complete story. Sure, a lot of it is glossed over in favor of keeping the story moving, but the artwork is appealing and all of the game is represented. I actually have a working theory that the downer ending is just the staff admitting they had no way of seeing the ending. Keep in mind, this was before the internet and everyone showing off footage of games spoiling the endings and whatnot, and Sonic Spinball is a brutally difficult game, not helped by the fact that a good portion of it is based around luck since it relies so heavily on pinball mechanics. Even the pun on the front cover calls out the game for its difficulty. So, taking that into consideration, I'm not nearly as mad at the non-ending as I should be. It's still a good story and a fine adaptation of a relatively fun, if not frustrating, game. After a one-page filler comic that is honestly much more funny than it has any right to be, we turn to our second story. A Sonic Christmas Carol? Well, that's a surprise, especially considering this issue came out in January and not December. I mean, even on the front cover near the issue number, it's wishing us a happy holidays despite the holiday season being over. I don't really know what the reason for this was. Maybe this was a story that had been written before but couldn't be squeezed into an earlier issue. Or maybe this issue was supposed to come out before the last one, or... I don't know. I don't run a comic publisher. Not that I could in this economy. Anyway, back to our story. We open with Robotnik as Mr. Scrooge berating Rotor Cratchit for insinuating that he's a penny-pinching miser. While he is pinching two pennies. Point to you, comic, that is actually pretty funny. This whole panel actually does have some nice funny details, such as the Rent-A-Hat logo on Robotnik's top hat, or the sign on his desk stating, The buck stops here. Rotor says that he should at least look into getting the roof repaired. The snow is getting a bit deep, you know, sir. Again, that's actually a really funny joke, though it would be a tad more effective if the reveal panel had been after a page turn, but hey, it still manages to be effective. We go through the standard tropes of the Christmas Carol story, with Rotor asking for the day off and Robotnik refusing at first, as he needs his facilities in top form so we can finish turning everyone into robots. Well, that's new. Wait, I'm just now starting to question why Rotor is working for Robotnik here. It's probably not important. Anyway, Robotnik agrees to give him the day off before returning to his factory where he resolves to eat his petroleum pudding, gross, and wait until Christmas is over. However, who should appear on his TV set but... Hey, it's Snively! Well, okay, for the purposes of this story he's called Jacob Snarly, but it's actually Snively, Robotnik's nephew and lackey from the Saturday morning cartoon, making his first real appearance in the comics. Kind of weird that his first appearance is as a stand-in for Jacob Marley, but whatever, I'll bite. He warns Robotnik that after he died, he was forced to become a television ghost, wandering from TV set to TV set. When I think of the infomercials I've been forced to watch... Well, it could be worse. He could be forced to watch Full House. They go through the standard rigmarole you would expect from an adaptation of the classic Dickens tale. He warns Robotnik to change or he'll face a fate worse than death, three spirits, etc. We cut to Robotnik in bed just as he's being visited by Sonic on a skateboard. 
When asked who he is, Sonic responds that he is the ghost of Christmas fast. Uh, past. And we get to see a flashback of when he and Sonic were kids, decorating the tree. Robotnik demonstrates that unlike the Scrooge of old, he's always been an asshole and attempts to plow down the tree with a tractor only for Sonic to create a ditch in front of it, thus ruining his nefarious scheme to destroy a Christmas tree. Wait, wait, we're in part two now? So this is the main story of the comic and the first story was the backup story? I, um, comics is confusing. We cut at breakneck speed to the present, where Sonic, the ghost of Christmas present, shows us what is happening in the Rotor Cratchit household. A package has just arrived from Robotnik, who states that it was a bomb shaped like a turkey, and he mailed it the day before. Sonic, not the ghost Sonic, but the actual Sonic, takes it and marks it return to sender, showing a bit of foresight. I mean, it was a gift from Robotnik, after all. Robotnik's none too happy about this, but before he can complain about it further, BAM! Future sequence! Robotnik sees himself as an old man, and is informed by the Ghost of Christmas Future Sonic that, in all the time he has been fighting Sonic and the other Freedom Fighters, he has never once triumphed, and now they are just as old and grey as he is, and the world has been turned into one giant junkyard. Robotnik Scrooge, I am asking you to give up your evil ways before you end up a pile of ruins in a scrapyard you created. This is your last chance. Just when it seems Robotnik might actually be considering it, he turns around to see that his future self has actually finally managed to catch the Freedom Fighters. And with Sonic as old as dust, unable to even do a Sonic spin, it looks like victory is pretty much assured for the Tyrant. Robotnik takes it well. Hear that, you futuristic fathead? Victory will one day be mine! Long live greed and evil! But before his celebration can continue, up comes an old mailman, carrying the same package that Sonic had returned to him all those years ago. Turns out he sent it fourth class mail, so it's just now getting here. Robotnik tries to stop his future self from opening the turkey bomb, but alas, he is too late. And a big explosion happens. It was so loud it woke Sonic up, who dreamed the whole thing. Yep, the whole thing was a dream, and apparently Sonic almost slept through Christmas. I hate to disappoint you, but you kinda did. As I've already pointed out, the comic was kind of published in January. Sonic leaps out of bed, hurrying off to make Christmas just a little bit special for all the readers out there. And so he zooms in a sneaker sleigh above all his friends who are caroling. And thus the story, and our comic, comes to an end. This comic was, much like the previous issue, pretty good. The first story, the main feature, which was actually a backup story, all things considered, was a good tie-in with the spin-off game, if a tad too short. I can forgive the downer ending of the story, considering that most kids who played the game would never see the ending anyway. The second story is a standard abridged Christmas Carol adaptation. It possesses little of the wit and symbolism that makes the Dickens tale such a classic, but for a kid's version, it covers all the necessary bases, and actually manages to pull out some jokes that are legitimately funny, compared to the cavalcade of puns that the comic usually throws at us. There are plenty of those too, have no fear, but especially near the start, there are some good zingers that got a good chuckle out of me. So how does this comic stack up? I'd put it about the same level as the last issue. It's not without its flaws, the biggest of which being that both stories are pretty inconsequential. The first one, while I can forgive it for doing so, still ends on a cliffhanger that never resolves in the comic proper, and as such comes off as rather depressing. The second story, as an adaptation of The Christmas Carol, is just okay, though I think it would really only do anything for someone who hasn't already familiarized themselves with the tale, and given the target audience of the comic at the time, that wasn't always a guarantee. It definitely doesn't do anything new with the formula, but it's fine for what it is. And what it is, is a Christmas story presented to us a month late. I know, I'm harping on it, it just seems really weird to me that the story wasn't put in a December issue. Also, since a majority of it is just a dream, well, I gotta take points off for that, too. Anyway, final verdict, the issue is worth a look. It's brought down by the inconsequential nature of the stories, but everything leading up to the underwhelming endings is solid. Even very funny at times. I should also mention that the artwork this time around felt pretty good as well. I haven't mentioned it much in the past issues because there wasn't really a whole lot to talk about other than a wonky face here and there. 
but this particular issue managed to keep a relatively well done and unified art style. It was subtle where it needed to be and only got cartoony where appropriate. I appreciate that. And so we close off yet another comic. Let's keep it rolling when we tackle issue 7 next time. Thank <laughs> you.